Martin. Sorry, yeah, right. I forgot. forgot. He is a farmer. Oh. Sorry, yes. Okay, once more. From the top. Again, Martin. <laughs> Two, okay. three, four. Ah. Oh. Wem Sports and Social, Shropshire on a cold Saturday night. This is a man who's had a tough time. You're right. Very nice audience, you'll be all right. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Martin Jones, and I have a small holding. <laughs> Particularly after a frosty night. <laughs> I'm one of the few dairy farmers left in Shropshire actually on the bone. We last spoke to Martin Jones three years ago at the start of the BSE crisis. It's been a long haul, but it should end soon with Europe lifting the ban on British beef exports. It's a very long term problem, this. BSE, which it still is going to take many years to clear up. And it's like a, a four lap race, and at the moment we're about two laps through it. And suddenly everyone's crying out, well, they want the finishing tape now. Well, unfortunately, that can't happen. We've had to, to deal with the problem and deal with animals that have got this for the last five or six years. And um, the public are going to have to bear with us. Do you like the waistcoat? <laughs> Chris had these done. I said, now you're not going to make me look a fool, are you? <laughs> he said, no. Give us a 12. <laughs> well, it could have been worse, could have been a bull. This farmer may be laughing now, but Alan Tudor's also had it tough. Three years ago, his Shropshire-based herd of 400 beef cattle became worthless overnight. We usually send about 40 a week. Um, we had to stop last Tuesday, and there's no sign of us being able to send any more for the foreseeable future anyway. We just hope that uh, something will sort itself out before too long, but at the moment we're, um, it's costing us about a £1,000 a week in feed for feeding animals that nobody seems to want. During the 18 months that followed the BSE crisis, um, everything suffered, the price of lamb, price of pigs, price of cereals, price of sugar breed, everything went down, and um, the, the year that has just ended Last March has probably been the worst year in my farming history of over 40 years. Indeed, for both men, the BSE crisis was just the start of three disastrous years. Public health is the most important thing, and if people were contracting CJD from from uh, cattle or cattle products that they'd eaten. That was a tragedy and, and you know, my financial situation had nothing to do, we had no comparison with, with somebody's tragedy from that sort of thing. And of course we were bolstered at the time because our milk price was good. Stock prices were still good. Um, but over the last three years, because of the deregulation of the milk industry. Uh, it's tended to turn farmer against farmer, milk producer against milk producer. It's created a feeling of great unease. At his farm in Astley near Shrewsbury, Martin's income has fallen so far he now earns more from singing his songs than from milking his 55 cows. Usually when I'm working, you just get an idea for, uh, you may just get an idea for a line of poetry or a line of a song, something amusing. And uh, I just tend to write it down on the calendar and 
so it's pinned up there and I keep walking back to it and I may not touch it again for another another month or so. Well, I mean, I can't sit down at a table and write something, but uh, sort of writing like this, it may seem a bit odd to some people, but you can actually pin it up on the milking jar at the end of the parlor. And uh, it's a bit like a sculpture, you know, you keep going back to it and you can see it up there and you can say, well, I'm gonna make that word work a bit more, or that's not very funny. And, and you keep looking at it, whereas if you're sitting at a word processor, I can't write on a word processor or anything like that, it's just, it's awful. But I like a bit of muck on what I'm, on what I'm writing. <laughs> Alan Tudor's selecting cattle for the abattoir. He's never had a case of BSE on his farm at Yockleton, and yet he earns £120 less for each animal than before the crisis. This one can go out, and the, and the next one. What? How do you decide which, is, which goes and which doesn't? Oh, well, we're looking, for, we're looking for one number 58 on this tag, and it's, um, it, it, it's got to go by its age, because its age is um, it's 30 months old on Wednesday, and so he's got to go before Wednesday. So if he doesn't go, well, um, they just chuck it in the bin and it's scrap. So that's how important their age is. They'll calm down in a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Come back, come back. Go on. Go on. Go on. The animals are reared with two tags and paper passports to ensure they're traceable from birth to our dinner plates. Alan's daughter-in-law, Louise, knows that a mistake here could cost money, even attract prosecution and a fine. What happens if you can't find the passport? It shouldn't happen. <laughs> it should be right. The cow wouldn't be here if it didn't have a passport, because we wouldn't buy it without the passport, because you wouldn't be able to sell it. If you didn't have one. This is a mixed farm of livestock and crops, including sugar beet, barley and wheat. Pre-BSE, we were getting up to um, £2.20 per kilo dead weight for, for our beef. The cattle we sent today um, is a big improvement on last year. Even We were down to £1.50 last year. At least we're up to £1.72 a kilo. We were getting £120 a tonne for wheat. We can't get £80 now. Um, we were getting £36 for sugar beet. Um, we're down to about £29. Uh, whenever the wife goes to the supermarket, I always say, well, what price has gone down? And um, the price of flour hasn't gone down, the price of sugar hasn't gone down. Um, I was in Sainsbury's myself yesterday and um, the price of beef um, was £7.99 a kilo and um, I'm selling mine today for £1.72. Right, um, I'm going to do a little song for you now uh, about a pig. It's a bit of a boring song. Really. <laughs> I don't know whether any of you have heard of Leonard Cohen at all. Uh, anybody, no one's admitted, yeah? So uh, we're, we're just getting the mood of this now. No expense spared here. <laughs> here we go. It goes something like this. Well, it goes exactly like this. <laughs> I bought a bull from the market He was bristly and had a big snout He had adequate breeding equipment And knew how to flash it about 
When I got home again and put him in a pen, he stood up on two legs by the door. With one foot on one hip and the other held limp, he daintily walked across the floor. <laughs> Do do do. <laughs> Martin Jones got so desperate he called in a farming consultant. This time last year, when our milk price was sort of going into freefall, and our rolling returns for milk income had dropped by about seventeen thousand pounds over the year. We were selling the same amount of milk, but getting about seventeen thousand less for it. Our overheads were still the same and I uh, felt we were caught in a bit of a, a pincer. I haven't got her in calf yet, actually. She's still uh, She should she's still actually repeating. be putting a bit yeah. more weight on than that, so yeah. maybe you want to increase the feed on that one. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. Uh, 85. OK, well, 85 is over there. Pop on top. I wanted someone to come into the farm and say, look, you know, what you're doing here, is rubbish, you should be getting more from this, or or the bottom line was, you know, really, there's no point in carrying on, get out now while you still have some assets about you. And I was quite prepared to face whatever anybody said at that particular time. I was, uh, initially came to see Martin, Martin was very depressed about the situation, uh, as most people are, and what I really felt I needed to do was give, try to give Martin some sort of um, um, light at the end of the tunnel, give him some confidence. P people who contact, contacted us were very unsure of the way forward, and they're very, they, they wanted somebody to, to, to say that, look, it's not the end of the world, there is a way out of this, as long as you improve var various areas of the business. The whole market has changed immeasurably over the last 18 months, really. Uh, with the milk price dropping, the, the problems with BSE, the problems with uh, livestock values. And, 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 and at the time, we picked up quite a few new farms who, who really just wanted a, an independent uh, view on their business. Right, so what, what we've got to do is just work out how many acres you need for cutting and grazing next year. Because yeah. the key thing for your business is to get more milk from forage. That's right, yeah. Um, the area that we've identified that yeah. you're weak on, that you've been weak on last year, is the amount of milk that you've got from the grazed grass. Yeah. So, so the priority, I think, for next year is to get the is to get the grass get more milk from the grass. From, yeah. from the grass. Yeah. In general, what's probably going to happen is the smaller farmers, the people under 50 cows, probably under 30 cows, will only survive if they go into a part-time, um, they farm part-time, you know, go out and get a job as well. Um, 40 to 50 cow people will survive if they're very technically efficient with relatively low borrowings and relatively low labour costs. And yeah, the bigger ones will be getting bigger. And I think possibly what's going to happen is the people who are more local to, the, to a creamery are going to um, get a better milk price than the people who are a long way from a creamery. It's just the way it's going, I'm afraid. I'd like to brighten up the proceedings a bit now. But I can't. <laughs> so I'm going to sing you a song about slurry. It's the slurry song. Square one. Spr 
spreading their droppings about in their usual way. Don't seem to care day after day. Many farmers are deeply in the mire. Government figures say their incomes have halved in just a year. This leads to desperation, depression, sometimes suicide. Clifford Evans runs a counselling service for his fellow farmers, which is currently picking up a new case in Shropshire every week. Well, isolation can be idyllic sometimes and may not at all be harmful. But the trouble is, is when a person becomes overloaded with, with worries and anxiety and overexhausted, and maybe ill. Because they're isolated people, they don't like asking for help. They're very independent. And they can very often turn inwardly on themselves and blame themselves for all their failures, and they can't see any help coming from anywhere. I have sometimes been on a farm where they've asked me to help, and there's been trauma. And the farmer that I am visiting has asked me to collect his shotgun and take it away from the farm because he felt that it is beckoning him. So I've taken it away for safety and put it in safe custody with police approval, of course. They're so frightened they'd use it on themselves? They're so frightened that they would use it on themselves. It, they say it, it's beckoning to me. And this is um, one of the most important parts of the week for me. Um, if it wasn't for my outlet of coming and doing a bit of bowling, I'm sure that uh, life on the farm would have driven me around the bend. And it's one of the things that's kept me sane during the problems of the last three years. I missed! When the BSE was at its height, it didn't necessarily mean that farmers were at their most distressed because they were all in the same boat together. They were all united. They all had the same problem. They could talk to each other. They could go to the markets and, and talk about the problem. I see a greater danger um, that as now the BSE situation is, is leaving us, farm incomes have deteriorated dramatically and some people aren't going to make it. Three years ago, it looked like the food processors might not make it. Everything had just ground to a halt. I personally am devastated about the whole thing. Um, I can't believe that it happened. And I certainly can't believe it's taking this long to resolve it. Export chiller. Completely empty. Completely empty. We probably won't fill this one again until we get the export market back. You don't know when that might be? I don't know when that might be. I mean, they're talking two or three weeks, hopefully, but other than that, I don't know. Much has changed here, but the new general manager is still pessimistic about the prospects for exporting beef. Clearly, we were very optimistic. We were hoping to get back our export markets, sadly, we haven't gotten back as yet, but in the near future we will have. We focus on the home market, which is our biggest market. We are importing 200,000 tonnes of beef into the UK annually, and we want to focus on serving that market initially. And these fridges are now full? These fridges are full at last. And how long did it take to get to that stage? At least 18 months to get back into full production. What makes producers gloomy about exporting British beef is the extra cost of new food safety measures. We have lost at least £104 from each animal. We've extra disposable charges for waste materials. We have additional charges for the meat hygiene service who are here on site in larger numbers. They've always been on site in the past. And we've lost value in the fifth quarter. That is the offals and the hide value. We're no longer abattoirs and meat processors, we're food factories. 
We need a traceability from conception right through birth, where the animal has been all its life, right through our process, down to the pack. We've still got export staff in our sales offices. We are exporting lamb on the continent at present. We have the safest beef in the world. We have the highest standards of beef in the world. We just want their standards to be similar to ours so we can compete on a level playing field. Today is an important day for Alan Tudor's son, Jonathan. He's preparing a pen for a new batch of calves, which signals an expansion in their business. It's a sign of how BSE has forced the family to adapt. Instead of buying older cattle, which they then fatten for slaughter, they now buy newborn animals and raise them themselves. The Tudors get to keep more of the profits and create a herd which can easily be traced from birth. of calves and it's nice to see that these have grown even though they're only a week older. It's always nice having smaller calves in because you can see how your, how your others are doing so it's nice. We're paying half what we were last year for the same sort of calves so I think we're doing reasonably well out of them. Just hope they do make money for us. But farmers are warned it's about to get tougher. European subsidies, which guarantee them a minimum price, are about to fall. To survive, they'll have to change again. Farmers sell things at the farm gate at the lowest possible price. The only way they can try and improve their business and get a better return is to two things, really. Collaborative marketing, in other words, more than one farmer working together. If they want to supply a customer, work together to supply that one customer if they themselves haven't got enough commodity to sell them. And secondly, to look at further processing and actually getting involved in that added, added value part of the product when it goes ex-farm gate. Frankly, a lot of farmers are getting out of crops and out of uh, livestock that is subsidised in order to go to ones that are not subsidised so they can operate in a market situation. It's the same with dairy and milk producers. The British dairy industry is probably the most efficient in the world, yet we're prevented because of crazy common market rules about subsidies preventing us selling our products on world markets. And the one way to do it is to get rid of the subsidies. We're encouraging uh, the major multiples at the moment to look seriously at sourcing more regional food. We know from surveys that we've carried out internally with, with the public at large that they would buy regional food if it was clearly labelled as regional food. For instance, Shropshire beef, Shropshire potatoes. They would buy it. What about the sausages today? Which am I going to have? Uh, the nice thin pork, or the thicker pork ones there, or the Ponsbury sausages on the left. What's special about the Ponsbury ones? Uh, we use a higher percentage of beef in the Ponsbury ones rather than the pork. Right. And uh, make sure that it's good, lean English beef I as was well. going to say, it's the usual English, because you don't have anything else really, do you? We only sell British, British beef, That's yes. That's right. In effect, supermarkets are under pressure to be more like local shops where regional food has always been sold. Meat sales in general are still very good. They've held up well over the last three years, but what we are finding around here, especially over the last three to six months, is that our customers are getting very patriotic. They're making a point of asking us where we get the beef and pork and lamb from. Is it sourced particularly from this country, but not just that? Is it local and are we supporting the, uh, the local farming community? Good evening, y'all. My name's Dolly. <laughs> Dolly Parton. <laughs> All the way from Texel. I'm going to sing you a little song. You think it's hard to be a woman. It's twice as hard when you're a lamb. Oh gosh, oh golly, 
My name is Dolly. Excuse me if I'm bleating, but my genes just keep repeating. When I ask, where are my parents? They pull the wool over my eyes. Oh, I'm so lonely. Why did they clone me? Variety is the spice of life, girls, but duplication makes my hair curl. Stand by your rag. You'll find more interest if you avoid the test you when you can. This is pretty good fun. <laughs> fun. It's a better, better way than making a living than waiting around in muck all day. I mean, okay, I look a bit of a fool sometimes. I mean, I don't look a fool now, do I? I mean, <laughs> I have a bit of credibility in market left, but uh, I don't know. I find it's a nice contrast to working with, uh, with cows. You're working on your own all day and uh, no one to talk to except the dog, and uh, she doesn't answer back very much. But uh, out here, if you can make people laugh and uh, leave people going home feeling a bit better, well, this is what it's all about. If I had the choice now, and there was a good market, I would be only too pleased to leave farming and get out of it. And that's after a lifetime of feeling that I was helping to feed the British nation, feeling very, very proud of what I did, feeling needed. But now, I can tell you, I will be pleased to see the back of it. I, I carry on because um, I've got a farm, I've got a, I own my own farm, um, I've got a son who's interested in farming, um, recently got married and um, got a wife who's interested in helping him farm. Um, I'm more excited about the future now than, um, than I have been for 20 years. If I got rid of all the cows, I could lease out my milk quota to another farmer who wanted to expand. Uh, and I could, this last year, I could get nine pence a litre for my milk by leasing it out. At the moment, I get 18 pence a litre for my milk, and that's by working seven days a week, uh, you know, nearly every day of the year. Um, I could have that money in my hand <laughs> at the beginning of the year and uh, never even have to get out of bed. And that, that again is uh, one of the odd things. People would say, well, why on earth do you do that? And I um, can't really give an answer to that. It's just part of the madness of the job. <laughs>